Welcome to this video tour of Ayton Castle. I'm Chris Hall, field archaeologist and historic buildings professional and a field officer for Scarborough Archaeological and Historical Society. In previous years, the Friends of Ayton Castle, working with our society, have held open days here. We're unable to do this this year due to the pandemic, so John Oxley, Emma Temlett, Marie Woods, Simon Temlett and I have put together this video tour of the castle. We hope you enjoy it. In the field behind me is a superb archaeological landscape called Ayton Castle Field. The ruined stone tower in the distance is the only building belonging to the castle still standing and was where the Lord of the Manor lived. At that time there were many other buildings in the field around the tower but these have long since disappeared and their positions are now only recognisable in some of the earthworks we see around us here, which we'll have a look at later on. Right, here I am standing outside the Tower of Ayton Castle, which was built by Sir Ralph Ewer in about 1410. Sir Ralph, who had estates uh, further north from here, had married into the de Ayton family, and it was the de Aytons who first developed the medieval manor house at Ayton, in the 12th and 13th century. Sir Ralph had experience of tower houses from his estates in the north and we think that's one of the reasons he chose to build a tower house here replacing the early manorial buildings which were just round the corner. They were discovered in the 1950s and 60s when excavations were carried out by Scarborough and District Archaeological Society as our, as our society was then known. Strictly speaking, it's not a castle. Licence to crenellate, that is built battlements, uh, was never granted. And if you look at it, it's very much more of an architectural statement than a piece of military architecture. For instance, if you look at the top, where there are matriculations, the projecting corbels with gaps between, where a school kids were always, always taught that people used them to pour boiling oil down on attackers, they're only sighted at the corner of the building and not in a position which would protect its vulnerable, vulnerable features such as the door and this huge window. This is a very, very important piece of architecture, quite unusual in this part of the country. And I think at this point that the Ewers are making a statement and I'll talk about that a little bit later on when we're actually inside the building. The de Ewers held the uh, castle until the 1600s. They sold it in 1640, although before that it was actually um, leased out to the Dornays, who now hold Wycombe Abbey. And by the 1680s, it was unoccupied. And we know from Walker's drawing, or etching, made in the, about 1796, that the castle was already derelict and presumably some of the stone has been taken away for use elsewhere, possibly for the building of Ayton Bridge. In the 19th century, the tower did have a new use as a cow shed, and the ground floor was converted for this use. And when the Archaeological Society first began, became interested in this site in the 1950s, a lot of clearing out had to be done, and that's illustrated in this photograph which was taken during the clearing out of the ground floor by Frank Rimmington and his team. We have a pretty good idea what the tower house originally looked like and this illustration shows it in its uh, full glory. We know for instance from the excavations that it was roofed in these stone tiles which were quarried up the valley here, up Forge Valley. Uh, they're held in place with a, a, a timber peg or a, or a bone and it possibly also had uh, clay glazed tiles, ridge tiles, uh, along the top of the roof. The excavations um, revealed all sorts of information about the, the occupation of the castle, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Right, my grandchildren are really impressed that their granddad has the keys to a castle. So here we are at the entrance to the castle on its west side, with this nice pointed arch here. This tower has often been referred to as a peel tower, but I think in peel towers the staircase is on the outside. 
in here, as we go in, let's go inside. Here is the staircase which goes up to the first floor. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on when we get up into the first floor. So here we are in the first undercroft room, which is the kitchen. And we can tell that by the, kit the fireplace, which is here in the far corner. A lot of the stonework has fallen away, but this would be the place where the food was prepared. This is a fantastic space with its tunnel vaulted ceiling and its ribs here running down, uh, supporting the ceiling. Over in the corner here, we have two openings. These are chutes coming in from the outside. We don't know exactly what their use was, but we think they were later insertion for perhaps bringing supplies into the kitchen, coal for the fire, and so on. So let's go into the far corner of the room to the doorway here. Now, it is often said that the, originally there was no doorway through from the kitchen into the next room. I have to say, I'm a little bit sceptical of that myself, looking at the construction here of this uh, huge stone. Um, I think what is pretty certain is that there, there was a very low doorway, which was raised a lot later on, uh, but if there wasn't a doorway here, it would provide, or would, would create rather, complications as to the way that supplies were got into the next room. And I'll talk about that when we move next door. So if this door was increased in height, as, as we think, um, that has huge implications for the construction of the undercroft. Um, you see here that the, the rib springs from a, a, a cobblestone here. That must have been removed here because the whole rib has been taken out. And the cobblestone, if you follow it through, must have been about here before, before the uh, opening was lifted. In 1911, the Yorkshire Archaeological Society became very concerned about the, uh, the integrity of the structure. And what they recommended doing was putting in a concrete lintel and putting in a reinforced concrete rib to replace the one that had gone. Fortunately, they didn't do it, because I think it would have looked horrendous, actually. And as it turns out, the, the, the construction of the tunnel vault is so robust that there has been no movement at all. I think what they must have done in 1911-1912 is put this um, stepped construction here uh, to support this part, bottom part of the tunnel vault, which I think must have been beginning to collapse. So let's go through into the next room now. So here we are in the second undercroft room, which is the buttery. A buttery is not specifically to do with butter, it's to do with it's the place where food and drink are stored. I think it comes from the word but, as in barrel, and butler, of course, comes from the same source. Uh, in the far corner here on the other side is a secondary staircase up to the floor above. And the entrance here, which we've just come through, let's just think about what, what the implications would have been if there was no door there. Supplies coming into here would come in through the main entrance, up the main staircase, across the first floor, down this narrow winding staircase here and put into storage, and then, when they're needed in the kitchen, back up, across the floor, down and into the kitchen, food's prepared, back up into the room above. And that's why I'm a little bit sceptical that there was no opening through there at all. I think there was a very low door before the um, present one which has been heightened. And some people have described that like a 1960s serving hatch, very popular in that period. So let's go over to the uh, staircase up to the next floor and we'll have a look at the first floor. So we're now going up the secondary staircase, which as you can see is really narrow and quite awkward. It must have been quite difficult getting supplies up and down here. We go through this door here and we emerge out onto the first floor and this is where the great chamber was. So here we are in the great chamber 
The Great Chamber is where the manorial activities took place, the administration of the estate, uh, household activities, food was served and, and eaten here. And the particular feature over here is the, the large fireplace and this huge window overlooking the Vale of Pickering to the south here. I'm just going to go over here and stand in the window embrasure. Trying not to fall out. Um, looking out we can see the River Derwent and that's quite a significant feature because the Derwent today marks the boundary between the parishes of East and West Ayton. In the medieval period it was also the, the division between the Lordship of West Ayton held by the De Aytons and the Ewers and the Lordship of Seymour held by the Percys. Now Seymour is in the distance there where there's that belt of trees running across before the scarp slope of the road starts and when the leaves are off the trees you can see Seymour Church and next to that is Seymour Manor House. So these two manor houses are intervisible and I think what's happening here is the Ewers are making a, a huge statement uh, to the Percys. Look at us, we are powerful, we can afford to build this, here we are. So having told you about the relationship between the manor house here and Seymour and the Ewers and the Percys, let's just have a look at one or two other features here. We can see up here that there's a ledge in the stonework where it narrows down and windows above. That tells us that there was a further floor on the castle, uh, which would be the private rooms of the, of the Ewer family. And then as we progress over here, up onto this mound, the excavations in the 1950s and 1960s showed that there was a later wall uh, across here forming a separate room uh, which was known as the solar and behind here just round the corner here we can see the staircase uh, coming up which was the main staircase providing entrance into the tower. The tower is now the only freestanding building here and seems to stand in splendid isolation Actually, it's within a very interesting wider archaeological landscape. The manor house itself was within what was called a precinct, an enclosure where cattle and people could come here for safety and there would be various buildings. So we're just going to have a walk around this area and have a look at what we can see today. spell that we've been having is really good for showing up features that um, are not normally visible. There's some masonry beginning to appear here and what we think that there is here, this uh, series of square, squared banks, is some sort of entrance buildings. Not necessarily in a gatehouse but uh, some sort of formal entrance to the, the, to the precinct which you can see uh, running around here. We're just going to follow this path up now and have a look at some other things we can see up at the top there. So the back of the precinct uh, is defined by this terrace running across here. Uh, and you see in front of it a series of sort of almost scoops out of the slope. There's one here, uh, there's one here, there's a couple more over here. So these are probably building platforms. So the enclosure would in include uh, buildings such as a granary, barns, perhaps a brew house, perhaps some dwellings, stables and so on. All, all the sort of buildings which are needed for the operation of the, 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 of the manor. The terrace continues right across this field and it has been suggested that this is the alignment of a Roman road running up towards Scarborough Castle. I don't believe it myself 
I think that's just a, a flight of fantasy. But as you look up slope, you can see a further series of terraces running across, um, following the contour across the slope. And they're either later garden features or possibly what are called strip lynchets, which arise from the, uh, the agricultural use of, use of the land. Let's just go a little bit higher up. get to this point looking back down we can see even better the building platforms either side there's two here one over there so what we're going to do now is walk along the north precinct wall because I've never seen this look standing out so prominently as a result of the dry weather you can actually see where there's presumably a, a wall running along here so we've come to the point where the north wall and the east wall intersect and as we look down slope we can see this marked bank running down and that, that is the wall marking the eastern boundary of the, of the precinct showing up quite, quite well in these dry, dry conditions and behind us here is, this, is the terrace running across, across the slope that some people think is a Roman road uh, and further uh, embankments higher up possibly to do with quarrying uh, now we're going to walk down following this parch mark on the embankment and go across and have a look at those two mounds over there. These two mounds that we're standing on now uh, result from the excavations which are carried out between 1959 and 1961 by Frank Rimington and he identified one as a lime kiln which would presumably have been uh, in use when they were building the tower house and one as a dovecot and we have an illustration of a photograph that Frank took uh, in 1959 showing what the uh, part of the interior of the dovecot. Dovecots were manorial monopolies. Only the Lord of the Manor was allowed to have a dove dovecot. Uh, that gave him a constant supply of food throughout the year. So that's an indication of a very high status house. And we think at Ayton there was possibly two dovecots. This one here and one a little bit further up in the far corner which is only visible on the ground as a, a slight circular er earthwork. Another indication of the importance of this house was the fish ponds. Again that's something which um, somebody of only of high status could have. Um, most people uh, didn't eat fish. So we're just going to go on over to this bank over here and look across to the fish ponds. So this series of square or rectangular rather earthworks rather highlighted by the buttercups are the medieval fish ponds. You can see running across the field here a brown strip that is the Leet, which is bringing water from the river, higher up the River Derwent, which I've shown you earlier on. There is a dam across a little bit higher up, which you can't quite see it from here. And the fish ponds will be where fish were both bred and, and kept uh, during the medieval period uh, to provide a source of food for the Lord of the Manor. There is a suggestion that later on they were used as garden features as, as well. So we're standing here on what might be the south precinct wall, uh, looking across again to the fish ponds over here, and finally over here towards another feature which would be associated with the, uh, the manor house, the, the mill. This is Ayton High Mill, the, the present building dates from 1843, but we know there was a mill somewhere in this vicinity from Doomsday Book uh, in the medieval period, and that would also be fed by water from a leaf running off the River Derwent over here. Okay, so that um, concludes our tour of Ayton Castle Tower and its uh, surrounding uh, landscape. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, tour of the castle and hopefully in years to come we'll be able to open it up again and actually take people inside it to have a look around. Thank you very much.
If you want to know more about Scarborough Archaeological and Historical Society and its work, go to www.shs.org.uk or you can follow us on Facebook. If you want to know more about the Friends of Ayton Castle and its work, go to www.aytoncastle.org.uk. Thank you.